You're listening to Milwaukee Mafia, your weekly podcast dose of Wisconsin Mafia and true crime history. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode. This is Eric Walterkins. I'm Gavin Schmidt. And Gavin, what do you got for us today? Well, Eric, I've got a very special surprise for you. He's got a special surprise. I like surprises. What's the special surprise? Uh, we're not actually going to talk about the mafia at all. Uh, do you Wait, see? Can I got to? I got to clarify. Yeah. We are on a mafia podcast. We correct? are. We okay. are. Okay. Yes. Okay. Just making sure. We. Yep. So what are we going to talk about? Okay, do you, do you see this book in my hand? I do see a book in your hand. Okay, I'm glad you can see this book in my hand because I can't see it. But, but by the time this podcast comes out, there will be a book in my hand because I have a new book coming out on April 26th. Really? I do. Tell us more. All right. It is called Great Lakes Pirate, The Adventures of Roaring Dan Seavey. Okay. So I figured today we'd take a slight detour and talk about a, a pirate on Lake Michigan. It sounds interesting. I'm, I'm ready to hear more. Okay. So I don't have any notes, but I just wrote a book, so I think I can probably wing this one. So our character is Roaring Dan Seavey, and Dan uh, grew up in Maine, and he was already, by the time he was a kid, he was kind of a mischievous character. Uh, he got caught counterfeiting in his youth. And he also got caught counterfeiting with his sister, and the newspapers speculated that him and his sister had a very special relationship. Wow. And I'm not going to elaborate, but it means exactly what you think it means. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, right off the bat, we've got some fun, uh, fun stories about him and his family situation, so that's nice. But he ends up moving from Maine to... Uh, the great state of Wisconsin, where we are. He settles in Milwaukee, where he opens up a saloon in the, I believe, the first ward. I could be mistaken, but it's in the downtown area um, on Michigan Street. And he does that for a while. He makes some friends. He actually makes friends with the Pabst family, of all things. So he gets to know uh, the Pabst family pretty well, and I assume everybody here knows that Pabst is a big brewing family. They make PBR. Uh, so he got to know them. And one of the things that Pabst did as a hobby was he liked to sail around. Apparently, when you get a lot of money, that's something you do. You buy a yacht and you just sail around for fun. So sometimes Dan would go out on the yacht, and he took a liking to it. He started boating and, and really, really liked it i guess because that's what he got to be known for later on was was boating more than anything else he had this sense of adventure where you know okay i'm a counterfeiter in maine i'm gonna move to milwaukee i'm gonna set up shop here he did that for a few years and he needed more adventure so you know what he did next totally different became a pirate not yet not yet okay. not yet <laughs> Darn it <laughs> that was a good guess though <laughs> now before he becomes a pirate what he does is he hears about this thing going on in Alaska called the Gold Rush, okay. and, and so this is like the 1890s. Just to put, I didn't, I didn't start out with the time period. I should have done that, but this is the 1890s. They have found gold in Alaska, and they're like, this is going to be bigger than California. We got to get people out here. So, uh, I mean, everybody's probably heard of the Klondike. Um, that's what this is. So he goes out there to try his luck. Uh, he gets some funding from the Pabst family and a few other people. And he goes out there and he tries to make do. And he's out there for a while, not a long time, maybe a year and a half, two years. And uh, how well do you think he does? Probably not very well. Not very well. Yeah. No. And most people didn't. It really was kind of a bust because he'd go out there and equipment was expensive. Trying to get around was expensive. There weren't really roads or anything. Uh, so you were always going through the mountains, avalanches trapping you, <laughs> you know, <laughs> things like that. And it was really just a very rugged place to be. There were more people, I think, who made their fortunes like in real estate and and the bar industry than there was really in gold. People found gold, but it was the little boom towns that sprung up that really that's where anybody made their money. Mm -hmm. And even Dan later on, he said the only money he ever made <laughs> was apparently there was a safe in one of these saloons. And the safe was so heavy, it fell through the floor of the saloon into the basement. And a guy offered him 500 bucks 
to get, get to get it back up <laughs> to the first floor. So he kind of makeshift made a little crane pulley system and got the safe back up because that's the only money I made when I was in Alaska. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, all the time he spent there looking for gold did not pay off. Crazy. Yep. Which I guess that is what I would expect from a gold rush. And I'm sure that California gold rush, when you think about that, probably the very much the same stories. I, I assume it's bag. very repetitive. I mean, uh, California gold rush had the advantage in that, like, a lot of people moved. And it and California became a state because of it, mm-hmm. um, which did not happen to Alaska. But, but in California, it did get a lot of people to move who ended up staying out there. But um, do you know anybody famous from the California gold rush? No, 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 no. no. You know, somebody, somebody got rich off of it, but we don't know who they are. And, and you go back, like you said, every, all the equipment was so expensive and stuff like that. So I, Mm -hmm. I, I assume that this is a situation like many things where it gets too big and then it just becomes so expensive to even get involved with it that it's just, becomes a lose lose uh, well like you said the people that are winning are the people that are capitalizing off yeah the hopes and dreams of other people trying to find gold out there yeah yeah my book goes into great detail about the gold rush and the the things that you'd have to do to be successful and really yeah you are better off being a supplier than actually looking for the gold mm-hmm. because the the markup on things is just outrageous oh, yeah so uh so he failed <laughs> and he comes back, and he kind of makes up. Uh, he sets up shop. Sometimes he's in the northern Wisconsin. Sometimes he's in the UP. So sometimes he's around Marinette, and sometimes he's in Escanaba. More often than not, he's in Escanaba. Um, he also would spend some time in the Garden Peninsula. Uh, and for those who don't know what the Garden Peninsula is, uh, if you go to Door County, and Door County comes to a point. And you keep going, and there's Washington Island, and you Mm. keep going, and there's Rock Island. Well, what you might not know is there's actually like a peninsula. It's like the mirror image of Door County on the other end. Really? Yeah, there's like two triangles touching tips. And so Garden Peninsula is like the Door County of the UP. Uh, That's the best I can explain it without actually drawing a picture. Um, And so he'd spend a lot of time there. And this is when he did. He took up what job? The pirating. Okay, now he's I'm now good. he's pirating. Good. What else is he going to do up there? <laughs> good. He's he's pirating, and pirating can mean any number of different things. I mean, if a ship has crashed, he can just sort of steal stuff off the crashed uh, ship and then sell it. Uh, there are many many ships that have gone down in the Great Lakes. Uh, a lot of them are still sitting there. So this was actually something you could do fairly easily. And again, think back. This is now we're like early 1900s up to maybe the 1920s at the latest. This is kind of its peak years. I mean, lighthouses, they exist, but they're not like these huge electric light things that they are now. Um, So there were more boats and fewer lights. Mm -hmm. You know, the cities weren't as lit up as they are now. So it was a lot easier to crash. If you got into a storm, you couldn't say, oh, well, Green Bay is over here. It's the big glowing thing in the sky. No. Mm -hmm. So a lot more ships crashing. Um, Or, you know, he might do the normal pirate thing where he actually goes onto another ship and just sort of hijacks it. This is what he got to be most famous for. There was a ship called the Nellie Johnson. And there's a couple variations on the story. But one version of the story is that he docks next to it he invites the crew into a bar, drinks them under the table, <laughs> and then goes out and steals the ship. And he's the ship is loaded up with lumber, and he sails it down to Chicago to try to sell the lumber. Well, between there and Chicago, they call the Coast Guard, and the Coast Guard's like, yeah, that's not going to fly. So he ends up getting in a race with the Coast Guard, and... It's really funny to me. Now, Now, Eric, you actually have boating experience. Not very limited, but yes, we'll go with that. The- but, but I mean, but you understand 
how fast boats actually go. Correct, yes. And it's funny because like it's written up as this exciting chase in the papers. <laughs> but when you but when you actually see what the speed they're going is like it's not like they're <laughs> really flying very fast. <laughs> And the bolts today, I'm sure, go considerably faster than the bolts did back in the ni- early 1900s. Yeah, and I don't remember exactly the number. I don't want to misquote it, but I want to say it's like they topped out at like 12 miles an hour or something. <laughs> I mean, it's like like this is not a chase. <laughs> But they end up they end up doing this this chase and um, some versions of the story say that there was there was cannonballs fired. Um, some say that that was just made up by the newspapers. There's some debate about that. But the chase really did happen. He did really get caught and arrested, and he had to go down to the court in Chicago where he was tried for piracy. The only man ever to be tried for piracy on the Great Lakes. So. Dan is brought to Chicago in the courts in Chicago, and he's tried for piracy. He's the only man in the history of the United States, really, um, to be arrested on the charge of piracy on the Great Lakes. There have been other pirates in the ocean, but in the Great Lakes, he's the only one. Um, He ends up getting off. He doesn't go to prison for this. And again, there's speculation. The papers at the time are full of a lot of strange stories. And some are like, oh, there was bribery. And some say, oh, one of the witnesses was too scared to show up. And I don't know what to believe. I don't know what the real story is. So, you know, I kind of lay out the different options. Um, But whatever the case is, he ends up not getting convicted. I'm curious. I want to take a step back to him being a pirate. So you talked about the instance where he drank somebody, a group of people under the table, went and stole their ship. When he was doing this piracy, is that was he stealing ships, or was it more about? A lot of times, he was just stealing the cargo. But in that particular case, yeah, he stole the entire ship. Okay, okay, so it could go either way. Yeah, okay. I would assume that the majority of the time was probably cargo related. Yeah, kind of yeah. Crime. He's going around in a boat called the Wanderer. So usually, he's just taking stuff, putting it on the Wanderer, and leaving. Um, but in this case, because it was it was timber, it was lumber. Um, I'm guessing that's why he took the whole ship because it's not really convenient to move that over. But I mean, these are, these are the stories that come up again and again, some of which I don't know how reliable they are. Some of which are pretty well documented where he does get into these drinking spats and then he'll challenge people to fights. Um, there's a couple of stories where like it's winter. So he like asks for the strongest guy in town to come out. He draws a circle in the snow and he gets in a wrestling match with the guy and, you know, whoever gets pushed out of the circle loses. And, of course, Dan always wins. Um, on another occasion, he actually kills a guy with a piano. Uh, like, I don't know. Like, apparently this is okay. Like, the paper wrote, oh, yeah, he killed a guy with a piano. No follow-up <laughs> story. Not like, oh, the police are after him. No, that's just cool. You killed a guy. Fine. So all these weird stories. And then, yeah, there's just on and on uh, things like this. For a while there, he's taking... um Men and women out on cruises, and the women are not the wives or girlfriends of the men. Uh, and I won't explain that further, <laughs> but again, um, y- you know what that is. Mm. Uh, so they end up getting some trouble for that. And actually pretty light. Every time he gets caught, the judge is just like, don't do that in my, <laughs> in my area. <laughs> he's, like, he's like, if you're going to do that, whatever, but don't dock here dog somewhere right. else <laughs> <laughs> so yeah a lot of people would like they just sort of he's not even seen as a bad guy they're just like oh yeah that's dan the guy goes around stealing things and stuff <laughs> <laughs> that's crazy and he becomes kind of like a like a hero and the stories get bigger and bigger as time goes on i mean his final days aren't that exciting he ends up actually dying in a nursing home in pesh to go like, so his final days aren't like he goes out in a gunfight. He's just some old guy in a nursing home. So he, you you talked about him going to court for this and then getting off. Mm-hmm. After he goes to court for the, this, is that the end of it? Or does he just no. go pretty much go back and continue to do what he's doing and just kind of... Does he ever get back in legal trouble at all or just kind of... Not as big. Like, like that's the big event. But, I mean, he's still, yeah, he's getting scolded every so often for these little things because 
um, ship cargo will turn up missing, and then they'll be like, oh, it's probably Dan. <laughs> so they'll, <laughs> they'll go and they'll try to connect him to things. And like I said, the women, that comes a little bit later. So, yeah, he's still getting in trouble uh, from time to time. But, yeah, nobody ever really, like, he's never ridden up as, like, this villain. Like, even when the Coast Guard is chasing him, like, they don't be like, oh, yeah, I hope the Coast Guard gets him. There's kind of like this hint where, oh, you know, screw the Coast Guard. Let, let him have his fun. So well, it's crazy. It's weird. And it's really strange. I am not a sailor, but like the newspapers of the time, especially like in Sturgeon Bay and Escanaba, like really heavy uh, uh, shipping cities, things like that. Like the way they write about these things is just really interesting because everybody there seems to kind of know like shorthand for things. They use a lot of terms that I like I had to look up. I didn't really know. Um, for different parts of boats or different things that boats do. And, and so like, they're always like making these little champions out of the, the local fishermen. And so like, this guy did this this week. And, <laughs> and like, I don't know how much of it to believe, but that was what the papers were. They were just all these exciting stories about what was going on in Lake Michigan of all things. Well, so. and you think about it back then. I mean, and I guess probably for a big part of it, those cities exist because that lake is there. Right. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, of course, that's going to be the biggest thing they're going to talk about in the local newspaper. Yeah. What else would they have to talk about? Sure. I don't know. So. Yeah. So he does different things. I mean, at one point in time, um, he operates a sawmill. The sawmill burns down. Two people die. uh, And then he's accused of purposely burning it to kill these two guys. Um, Wow. Which which he denies. And eventually he's not uh, not held responsible for it have you looked into this do you believe that he probably wasn't responsible not enough evidence to really make i wouldn't say there's enough evidence one way or the other so what happened is he had to go to a coroner's inquest i think you and i talked about that in a previous episode and a coroner's inquest is basically like a bunch of guys show up they look at a dead body and they ask people hey what do you think happened to this guy yeah (laughs) and so the one guy the one guy they look at and they're like, oh, yeah, he burned to death. And the other guy, they're like, well, it looks like he was burning to death. But then he jumped in the lake and he ended up drowning. And they're like, it was an accident. <laughs> so uh, do, do I know if he did it? I have no idea. But the people who were held responsible, like they were just like, this looks like something that happens. So it just says accident. And, and I think we should point out for anybody that might not have listened to that previous episode, when they have this group of people looking at the the – scene or whatever Mm -hmm. to say what do you think happened here they're not necessarily qualified to make that decision whatsoever not at all all. it's could be just a guy that works at the grocery store down the street that gets pulled in to do it right the people who do it are called a coroner's jury and it's literally like a jury it's people randomly pulled out of the county to come look at the body and make a decision yeah so yeah they they might know yeah, <laughs> but they might have no you idea. You might pull a doctor out or something that might have something useful to say, but for the most part, most people are probably going to just look at it and be like, "Oh." Yeah. So, so you know, there's a, that's something that happens. Sawmills burn down, people drown. It happens. So, <laughs> yeah, no no big deal there. Um, trying to think of anything else that he I mean, there's strange stories. Like he claimed that he worked as a stunt double in a Hollywood movie. Um, there's no evidence whatsoever that this <laughs> happened, but he would tell people that. So there's just all kinds of just random weird things. So I think the obvious question to ask, and probably what most of the listeners would be thinking at this point in time is, okay. how, so you historically look, are researching mafia, mafia yes. related things in Wisconsin. Yes. Obviously this guy is from Wisconsin, resided in Wisconsin. So yes. there's a tie there. But how did you ever get turned on to this story to decide to write a book about it? Okay, so that's a great question. Thank you. Um, This is how this works. Anytime I'm researching something, you always end up with just a massive amount of stuff that you don't use. And so while you're researching the mafia, you're going to find other things. And one of them is like people who would smuggle alcohol across the Great Lakes from Canada. and whether Dan did that or not, I don't know. It's hard to say. He was active during the right time period, so he could have. 
but he was never caught. So I don't want to speculate on that. But either way, when you're reading about this, his name will pop up. Like people will be like, oh, other great things that happened out there in Lake Michigan, Dan (laughs) Seavey. And, you know, so I'm curious. So I look into it and um, there isn't much out there. And then I find there's, there's one other book on on Dan and I use book very loosely because it's 19 pages. <laughs> uh, and it's not a, that it's a bad book, but it's 19 pages. It is, yeah. So I'm like, oh, I think there's probably more than that. And so I looked and uh, yeah, there is more than that. I mean, my book's not huge, but it's like 150 pages. So it's a significant improvement <laughs> over 19. And uh, yeah, that's just how anything happens with the way that I write books is you know, I, I gather enough information where sooner or later that becomes the next topic. And a lot of times it's um, the mob. But if it's anything Wisconsin history, Wisconsin crime, it's, it's going to end up on my radar sooner or later. So and, that, that's where CV came from. And the decision to write about this pirate as opposed to because you said there was plenty of other pirates out on the Great Lakes. Not on the Great Lakes. No, not on the Great Lakes. I'm sorry. No. Oh, yeah, that's right. You said on the ocean. but Yeah, yeah, So yeah. this is really the only known pirate on the Great Lakes. He's credited as the only pirate, yes. That's crazy. Yeah. I mean, there's some technical. There's That's a whole other story uh, that we're not going to get into um, unless somebody specifically asks. Um, but they're <laughs> up in... Up in the same area, there was an well, there's still an island, but there was an island called Beaver Island. And Beaver Island was a Mormon colony, <laughs> but it was a Mormon colony of Mormons who were kicked out of um, the Latter day Saints Church. So these are like renegade Mormons. Okay. And yeah, and they, w- they would do their own little version of piracy, they weren't sailing around doing things. But if you came too close to their island, they would confiscate your stuff. <laughs> so, and is it is Beaver Island something now, or is it basically just a abandoned island? I guess there might be some people there, but it's not. It's not like a. It's not a major attraction, attraction or, anything, or anything. Yeah, like and the Mormons aren't there anymore. And the Mormons have left. Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> not that I have any problem with Mormons. No, I just <laughs> there's nothing wrong with Mormons. But these were a strange group. <laughs> Very cool. So again, why don't you give the, everybody the there? We are you're through. You don't have anything else with the story. No, that sounds pretty good. Okay, <laughs> so why don't you tell every give everybody details of the specific date that the book gets released? Okay. So the book comes out April 26th, which I think is today. (laughs) It is yesterday. Okay, yesterday? Yep. All right. This is what I get for recording in the past. (laughs) Okay. It's called Great Lakes Pirate, The Adventures of Roaring Dan Seavey. It's available anywhere books are available. Not sure where that is anymore, but if nothing else, you always got Amazon. And and being that I'm... Not very intelligent in the book publishing world. Okay, ironically, um, it your book gets published. It, can they purchase it on Amazon immediately, or does oh. it, is there a layover for that to hit? No, I mean as as we're recording right now, this minute, uh, which is in the past for those listening. <laughs> I mean, you could pre order it right oh, now if okay. you wanted okay. to, okay. but so. it'll but it'll actually be out. On the 26th. So if you order the 26th and you got, you know, your prime shipping, you'll have it in a day or two. So Very cool. And I think that we should probably maybe take a little bit of time in upcoming episodes. And maybe we should just walk through all your books. You know, just a real quick and sure out- outline <laughs> of what each of your books are, what they're called, so people can... You never know. You might sell a book oh, by doing it. Nobody wants to hear that. And nobody wants to hear that? No. You have a podcast dedicated to one of your books. So nah, it's not just one, though. Well, yeah. One and probably mix of some yeah. of the other ones and a whole bunch of additional research. But yeah. you get my point. So, all right. Are we done for this episode? You I think so. Else, anything else out there? No, I mean, no, nothing else other than, you know, of course, you can always reach me at Milwaukee Mafia at gmail.com or Milwaukee Mafia dot com if you prefer a website. And everybody, keep please keep listening. 
We're super excited about all the viewers we've gotten so far. We're very excited, and I think our sound finally works. Yes. <laughs> and we are in a new podcast studio oh, today. Oh, we are. That's true. Yes, it yes. is. It's quite nice. So. Okay. I don't know. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day, and we'll see you next week on the Milwaukee Mafia podcast. I'm Eric Waltergens. I'm Gavin Schmidt. Peace. Thanks for tuning in to the Milwaukee Mafia podcast. Join us next week for another look back at Wisconsin Mafia and true crime history.